difficile. Scripture reading today is from Colossians 4, verses 2 through 6. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, paying, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I also have been imprisoned, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Happy, happy Fourth of July weekend to you, and uh, Thanks to all those in our family who have boats and are out camping this weekend. We have lots of elbow room this morning in the sanctuary, so you can thank them next week when you're uh, snuggling in close. Let's join me for a prayer this morning as we come before the throne room of God. Father, thank you this morning for the blessing of living in this nation of many freedoms. Lord God, you have blessed us beyond what we deserve. And Lord, we confess that too often we have used our freedom to go beyond the wise restraint of your word. And though the people of this world rage and devise vain things against you, we know that you are God who sits in the heavens and you laugh at their vain attempts to dethrone you. Man's self-righteous anger is but a smoldering match, while your righteous anger none can withstand. Man's favor is but a fleeting spark, fleeing spark, while your, right, while your favor is an eternal flame. And so, Lord, we want to stand under your favor, under Christ who's absorbed all of the wrath of God for those who trust in Him. We want to stand under your favor knowing that you reign with perfect justice and that one day you, your justice will overtake this world in all its fullness. Lord, your word tells us this morning that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. And so, Lord, this morning we pray, bless our nation, bless our nation with righteousness with an increasing number of people who seek to do what is right in your eyes above all else. Bless our nation with repentance, to repent of idolatries of every kind and the humanism that seeks to replace you with ourselves. Bless our nation with faith in the only God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Bless our nation with a pure church that is bold, courageous, wise in the Scriptures, empowered by the Spirit, salt and light, undefiled in its witness. Bless our nation with deliverance from demonic ideologies within and hostile enemies abroad. Bless our nation with revival of spiritual fervency and holiness. Bless our nation with spiritual awakening so that many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Bless our nation with worldwide influence for Christ. Lord, your eyes are toward the righteous and your ears attend to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And so, Lord, cause your word to burn in our hearts, even now, in this, this moment, under the preaching of your word, that we may do what is right in your eyes, that your favor may be upon us, Make us your instrument by which many turn from darkness to light through faith in Jesus alone. Lord, in these moments, quiet our hearts with humility and grace to receive 
to hear, to respond. Not to tie, but to the Lord God Almighty through His Word. Give us this integrity, we pray, Lord God, and the joy of walking in obedience and faith because of your grace at work in us. In Jesus' name, amen. I am deeply, deeply thankful to be a citizen of the United States of America. And I, I consider it a divine blessing that should not be taken for granted to live in a land of many, many freedoms. And while our nation is not without its flaws, its freedoms should never be taken for granted. In my younger days, I had the opportunity to, to, to travel um, to uh, 14 other countries, many of them beautiful and all of them with precious people. And yet I always returned to the U.S. with deeper gratitude for my homeland. It seemed to me in those days that our great nation was nearly invincible. And yet today our hearts weigh heavily as we look around us and behold a lack of gratitude, a lack of godliness growing exponentially, a lack of civility that has overrun politics, a lack of earnest discourse in pursuit of truth and true justice. Too often today, these things have been replaced with angry shouting, name-calling, slander, intimidation, and even violent rioting. I don't need to tell you this morning that the temperature is high. There's a multitude of, of highly flammable issues that are stressing our nation. Wow, you know, it's not that long ago. Just a few months ago, we could raise the blood pressure in the room by just simply saying the word COVID. And now, I don't think COVID even makes the, the list of top 10 highly volatile issues in our country. I don't think COVID even makes the, uh, the list of the top 10 most combustible issues like abortion, Inflation, immigration, guns, violence, cops, racism, gender, courts, wokeism, and the list goes on and on and on. And Christians are not immune to the passions that surround these kinds of issues in our country, nor am I suggesting that we should be. Much of what is happening should be deeply concerning to us and at times should even invoke a, a, a sense of righteous indignation. I cannot get out of my mind seeing images in the news of protest signs by pro-abortion individuals whose signs simply read, dismember. Dismember. It should stir us deeply. And yet I believe Colossians 4 is a wise warning to guard ourselves against the spirit of the age when it comes to how we engage over these things. And by the way, I, I think there's a, there's a tendency for us as Christians to want to just avoid these topics when we are out in the general public, unless we're talking to people we really know where they're coming from, and they're kind of, kind of on our side on these topics we, we want to avoid. I don't think we should avoid talking about these things. We need to talk about these things, but we need to do it in a way that is distinctively Christian. This is a time of incredible opportunity for us to not only be a people of unwavering hope and lovers of truth, it's an incredible opportunity for us to champion the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only by our message, but also by our method. Every one of these issues that's troubling us and stressing our nation are secondary issues that should point us to a primary issue, and that is how our lives can be reconciled to God and ultimately <clears throat> be under His favor. Church, we must be known for our reasoning. We must be known for our wise conduct. We must be known for our grace-influenced speech. We can love people who hate us. We can appeal to the power superior to politics by our prayers. 
This is our day of opportunity to pray, to live, to speak on behalf of Christ who transforms lives from the inside out through the gospel. So when Colossians 4 says, devote yourselves to prayer so that, you will, so that God will open a door for the word, when Colossians 4 says, conduct yourself with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity, when Colossians 4 says, let your speech always be with grace so that you will know how to respond to each person, this is God's word for this very hour. A call to stand distinctively like Christ and for Christ. This is neither a time for us to hunker down in survival mode nor to bitterly rage like the world, but to seize divine opportunities in our daily relationships to model and message God's grace to others. This is in season. You ready, church? I need this. I'm guessing you probably need it too. The encouraging news of today's passage is that we have the privilege of walking through doorways of divine opportunity to advance the gospel of grace in tumultuous times. Paul writes these words from prison to encourage the Colossians and us with three ways to strengthen our witness for Christ in a godless wor- world through our prayers, through our conduct, and through our words. All right, here's the first. We must pray for God to do His supernatural work of opening doors for the gospel. This is our charge, church, to pray for God to open, supernaturally open doorways for the gospel. Verse 2, chapter 4. Devote yourselves to prayer keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the Word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. I often say to those who gather in the prayer room on Sunday morning, and you're always welcome to join us at 9.30 to pray for our service, for the gathering of God's people, for the worship of God's people, the preaching of His Word. I often say to those who gather in the prayer room before the service, this is the work of ministry. Prayer, right here, what we're doing right now in this moment as we pray, this is the work of ministry. Not to diminish the importance of studying to preach or the importance of our our team preparing to lead worship, but to say that none of our preparations make a lasting uh, impact apart from the Spirit's work through us. It is God who must work in us and through us. Amen, church? And so prayer is of utmost importance, which is certainly the message Paul is communicating in verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Paul begins with a general yet strong call to a life of total devotion to prayer. Total devotion. Now, I'm not talking about praying in the formal sense 24 hours a day. Most of us don't have that luxury. Most of us have to go to work. Uh, Most of us think we need to eat. Rather, what I'm talking about is bathing all of life in prayer. I want to challenge us to consider this morning that that every Christian must give serious consideration to the vital role of prayer in his or her life. Apart from a vital life of prayer, God will not have a vital place of supremacy in your life. That's not an exaggeration. Apart from a vital life of prayer... God will not have a vital place of supremacy in your life because prayer is your access to God. Prayer is your access to God. Prayer is the lifeline of, of genuine, excuse me, genuine relationship with God. Now listen, we have, we have over a thousand pages Over a thousand pages of instructive history and clear teaching in the Bible. But it will do 
little benefit for you if you don't walk in an intimate relationship with God through prayer. Don't just read the Bible. Now, you know here at Trinity, we're Bible people. Read the Bible, study the Bible, memorize the Bible, live the Bible, right? But if you only read the Bible and you are not stopping to engage and recognize your need for the Spirit of God to work out these things in your life and your heart and your mind and your relationships, the Bible will be of little value to you. The best thing you can do for your um, Bible intake and the best thing you can do for your relationship with God is to pray your way through the Scriptures. How else can we experience the Spirit's power to apply its transforming truth to our lives? I want you to just imagine a, uh, a good Christian who reads his Bible every day but has not much of a prayer life. Imagine going a whole week or even an hour hearing every word your spouse says to you but never responding with a single word. Never, yep, I hear you, I got it, nothing. We would call that relationship cold, <laughs> wouldn't we? Just ask your spouse how they would label that relationship. It would be cold. We must be devoted to prayer, according to verse 2, or continue steadfastly in prayer. And this word here, devoted, carries the idea of perseverance, to, to constantly attend to. We are to pray with unceasing diligence. Now it's noteworthy that this word is used six times in reference to prayer in the Bible, in the New Testament. Six times. And I don't want you to take it for granted. I'm going to show you where it comes from. Obviously Colossians 4.2. Acts 1.14, the early church. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer. Again in Acts 2.42, they were continually devoting themselves to to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Acts 6 4, the apostles said, We will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Romans 12 12, rejoice in hope, persevere in tribulation, be devoted to prayer. Finally, in Ephesians 6 18, with the, with the same Greek language roots, Pray at all times in the Spirit. Well, how do we do this? How, how do we live this kind of devoted life of unceasing prayer? Well, two ways. First, be mindful of your union with Christ. Be mindful of His constant presence with you so that you think in conversation with Him. If you're mindful that Jesus is always with you, that you're always living in the presence of God, you'll be more likely inclined to converse with God throughout your day. But secondly, we need to have moments in our day that are set apart for focused prayer. We can't go deep with God. We can't get intimate with God on the run alone. Praying for particular people in your life. Praying for God's provision for your needs. Praying for His work in your own heart, etc. And don't forget, again, to pray your way through what you're reading in the Bible. Now, in addition to calling us to a life of devoted prayer, verse 2 calls us to keep alert in prayer. The term here is used most often in reference to the end times, to the day of the Lord, the coming of Christ. In other words, don't grow drowsy. Don't grow discouraged or dis excuse me, distracted by a preoccupation with this world. Have you ever been so preoccupied with what you're doing, so focused on what you're doing, you didn't notice somebody walk up to you until they startled you? Yeah. It gets more common as you get older and your hearing gets poor. Uh, I've noticed. Believers, we should not be startled when Jesus comes. So don't get so preoccupied with the, the present temporary matters of earthly life that you lose sight of the bigger picture of the spiritual world and God's purposes. Don't get so distracted by um, making a living and doing your work and mowing your lawn and chasing the kids that you, you forget to notice what God is doing around you and how God wants you to actively engage with people around you. Be devoted in, to prayer, keeping alert in it. 
with an attitude of thanksgiving. By the way, the best way for me to stay alert to my neighbors in my neighborhood who I need to build relationships for, for the sake of Christ, is to pray for my neighbors. To pray for them as I walk by their houses, to pray for them. And to do this with an attitude of thanksgiving in verse 2. All prayer can and should be, should have an overtone of thanksgiving, regardless of how sketchy your present circumstances may be. Why? Because we can look behind us to the cross, we can look forward to heaven and see that we are ultimately secure in this sketchy world. No matter how insecure you feel because of your present circumstances, your soul is secure in Christ. Give thanks. Give thanks. I remember watching my son and his classmates do the high ropes course. They were walking across beams and then eventually ropes as high as the treetops, sometimes above the treetops. I've never been so glad in my life for a back injury. I walked right up to the instructor and said, I can't climb up there. I'm disabled. (laughs) You think being on a roof is bad. As I watched them go across, they had, uh, above them was a cable to which they were tethered in case they lost their balance and fell. And the only question was, are they tethered to the cable, and is that cable securely anchored at both ends? That is what the cross behind us and heaven before us do. They they secure our confidence that the safety rope is, cable is secure. They anchor our eternal security as we walk the tightrope of life by faith. Knowing the sufficiency of our past redemption, that's what Colossians is about. Knowing the sufficiency of our past redemption and the invincible promise of our eternal reward in heaven infuses all of life with thanksgiving. Are you tethered to the eternal security through genuine faith in Christ? I remember remember being on the ground every time they switched positions on the course, listening for the click, listening for the click. To be tethered to the cable, that's faith, taking hold of the gospel, clinging to Christ, and the hope that is tethered through the cross in our future reward. The next question then is, what do we pray for? If we're to pray all the time and pray, stay alert in prayer and pray with thanksgiving, what should we pray for? Well, Paul is going to give the Colossians some specific requests in verses 3 and 4, but notice he prefaces those requests by saying, Praying at the same time for us as well. Okay, pause for a moment. If you're a good student of Scripture, if you're, if you're watching for details, you'll notice then that Paul is saying, basically, in addition to the things you're praying, pray for these things for us as well, right? So my question this morning is, well, what are the earlier things we should be praying for? What are the, what are the always things we should be praying for? Well, probably the safest answer is to say that we should pray for Everything. Church say everything, right? But I assume you know that. But there is a hint in Colossians that I would hate for us to overlook in answer to this question. Back in chapter 1, Paul wrote out his own prayer for the Colossians. And what I simply want to point out to you is that what Paul prayed for the Colossians in chapter 1 is a blueprint for how he instructs them to live in chapter 4. There is remarkable parallels here we should not overlook. Let me give you some examples. Chapter 1, verse 9, Paul says, We have not ceased to pray for you. Now in chapter 4, verse 2, he says, He calls the Colossians to be devoted to unceasing prayer. Chapter 1, verse 9, Paul prays that they will be filled with the knowledge of God's will with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now in chapter 4, Four, verse 5, he calls them to conduct themselves in wisdom. 
In chapter 1, verse 10, Paul prays that they will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, walk worthy of the Lord, which is parallel to Paul's instructions in chapter 4, verse 2, to conduct their lives with godly wisdom. Both Paul's prayer in chapter 1 and his call for prayer in chapter 4 are marked with thanksgiving. And finally, in chapter 1, verse 10, Paul says they, uh, prays that they will please the Lord in every respect, bearing fruit in every good work, while instructing them now in chapter 4, verse 6, to always let their speech be seasoned with grace so they will know how to respond to each person or opportunity that God gives them. I point this out simply to encourage you to use Paul's prayer in chapter 1 as a pattern for how you pray for yourself, for your spouse, for your kids, and others. Along with praying about specific circumstances, like, Lord, protect my kids as they're coming home from Mexico. Right? Along with these specific things that we pray about circumstances, we could do no better service to others than praying that they will be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that they will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, that they will be strengthened with all power, God's power, His glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints. I would suggest to you this morning that this is the most practical way for you to pray for others, because when God does this internal work of transformation and wisdom on the inside, it will impact every decision they make in the details of their life. You know what they need more than your prayers for them to do what you think they should do? They need your prayers for God to give them spiritual wisdom and understanding. Amen? So I encourage you to take Colossians chapter 1. It'd be great to memorize those three verses, verses 9 through 11 or 12, whatever it is. 12. And, man, this, this, this is one of my favorite prayers to pray over my kids in the morning before school or wherever we're, we're going. And uh, you don't have to stop with Colossians 1. It, j- let me give you a little, here, this is a freebie. I'll give you a little acronym this morning. Every prayer counts. Say it with me. Every prayer counts. E-P-C. It stands for E-P-C, Okay. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, they're in order. Chapter 1 of each of those books has a prayer much like this, but unique for you to pray for yourself and for others. Use the word to pray. Use the word. Now, in verses 3 and 4, Paul gives specific prayer requests that God would open a door for the gospel so that he can proclaim Christ to those who haven't heard and that Paul's gospel preaching would be clear. Verse 3, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the Word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, the revelation of Christ, for which I have been imprisoned, and that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Church, This is where all missions and all evangelism begins. With prayer for God to open doors of divine opportunity and to open people's eyes and hearts to the true hope of the gospel. This is where it begins. Always. If you are going to go and share the gospel with your neighbor, more power to you, don't do it until you've been praying. You better be praying on the way, right? Because we need a supernatural work of God to open those doors and to open people's hearts to the truth. And as we devote ourselves to a life of prayer, we must not forget that our primary mission in this world is to uh, to point others to Jesus Christ as the only hope of eternal life. And that first step is praying for God to do His supernatural work in their hearts. So let me ask you this morning, who, does, who has God strategically placed in your life that needs your prayers for God's supernatural work of opening doors to hear the gospel clearly? 
he may answer that prayer through someone else, or he may answer it through you. But who is God strategically placed in your life that you can intercede for, that you can pray for? Oh, God, I plead with you in Jesus' name to give open doors of opportunity for them to hear the gospel, for me to uh, live a life that is consistent with the gospel, for me to share with them the hope that I have in Christ. The first way to strengthen your witness is through devoted, a devoted life of prayer. Secondly, we must wisely conduct our lives to be conducive to gospel opportunity. So now we're moving from prayer to how we live. Okay, Paul's moving from how we pray for people to how we live before people. Verse 5, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders. Who are outsiders? Unbelievers those outside the church. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. As we've already seen, the purpose of our life on this earth is not to acclimate to this world, but to be alert, watching for the return of Christ and helping others be prepared for His coming, to embrace Him as as Savior and Lord. And yet our prayer for God to draw our neighbors and friends to Christ will be stunted if we are living contrary to the ways of Christ. So the goal, the goal is for our lives to lend credibility to the gospel. So if if the gospel is a message of hope, our lives should manifest hope, right? Keep that in mind with all the stuff that's going on around us in our country today. Keep that in mind, you are are a man or a woman of hope. That cannot be taken from you. Your hope is not based on politics. Your hope is not based on the direction of our nation. Your hope is not based on other people or political parties. Your hope is grounded in Christ. Amen? If the gospel is good news of God's grace, then our lives should bleed grace. And I choose those words carefully. Because sometimes grace is most needed when people cause us to (laughs) bleed, right? Bleed grace. If the cross bears witness to God's forgiveness and mercy, then that's what we want our lives to emulate, forgiveness and mercy. If we have been reconciled to God as, as a generous, loving Father, then we should imitate our Father with love and generosity. And on and on and on we could go. We need to think about gospel implications for how we live day to day. Now I know that most of us are more alarmed than elated by the days in which we live. But Christian, this is a day of opportunity. This is a day of opportunity, just as it was in Paul's day as he was writing this letter from prison. It's a day of opportunity. Notice that Paul did not write from prison and pray, or say to the Colossians, pray that God will release me from this prison. (laughs) No, he prayed, pray that God will open a door for the gospel. Paul didn't know if that door would be open in the prison or out of the prison, but he prayed more than anything that God would open that door for the gospel to go forward. And then he tells the Colossians on the outside, keep doing the work. Live for the sake of the gospel. Paul was in prison. The Colossian church was facing the pressure of an unsympathetic world. And Paul's message to them and to us is, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most making the most of the opportunity. Opportunities don't always look pretty, church. Opportunities are often messy. Opportunities come in all kinds of strange ways. Uh, They can come through some surprising conflict that arises with a neighbor. (laughs) And now you got to go figure out, how am I going to work out that conflict with my neighbor? i got to represent Christ in how I go about this. God, keep my heart in check. Uh, They they, they may arise when when a neighbor has a baby or is ill, and you have the opportunity to go and serve them. 
we had a really unique opportunity to arise that I'm going to get to pursue this week. We, <laughs> we were re- reprogramming our garage door opener because uh, our, our little keypad in the garage burned out. We had to put a new one up. And while we're programming, our neighbor drives by and hits his garage door opener and programmed his garage door opener onto my, his, his, pr- his number onto my <laughs> garage door opener, my garage door. So every time he opens his garage door, mine goes up too. He doesn't know that yet. And I said to my wife, well, we're going to get to spend some time with him today. I get to g- have a good, another reason to go over and have a conversation with that neighbor. <laughs> Talk about being unequally yoked, I'll tell you. <laughs> we have to make the most of the time, of the opportunity, but we don't always have opportunities that come beautifully wrapped, like this one is. Church, if you are on an airplane that begins to go down, the engines are down and you're going to crash. Christian, putting on your oxygen mask and retreating to the fetal position is not the right thing to do. The right thing to do is to raise your voice above the shrieks of terror and declare, call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. That's where you go. If you have 18 seconds, you tell people, Jesus is the only one who saves you from hell and sin and he welcomes all who call upon his name. You know, we were never meant to get out of this world physically alive. Not most of us, unless Jesus comes today. Not most of us. We were meant to toss out the life raft of the gospel to as many as possible who are perishing while there's opportunity. So how do we walk in wisdom toward outsiders so as to make the most of the opportunity? Well, there's a, there's a, there's a thousand ways. I'm going to give you a few suggestions because... There are some that are very commonplace, very normal, everyday things, and others that are more pointed. How do, we, how do we make the most of the opportunity? Well, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We're to walk in wisdom toward outsiders. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, which can be summed up in knowing God and honoring His commands. In other words, conducting ourselves with wisdom means living our lives in harmony with the commandments and the character of God. As simply as things like living a life of integrity and a diligent work ethic, not being rude or stingy or greedy or selfish, but rather a life that demonstrates the attractive character qualities of Christ within us, like being hospitable, cheerful, winsome, encouraging, building others up, serving others with large-hearted generosity, looking for opportunities to help and meet needs. Being quick to forgive and not easily offended. And ultimately looking for opportunities not only to not only imitate Christ, but also to speak of Christ. One of my neighbors came over one time. (laughs) My neighbors know that I'm not a carpet a carpenter or a fix-it man or any of those kind of things. My my neighbor stopped, older, older man, stopped over one day, see what I was doing, and monkeying around my garage, I was trying to fix an outlet. And he said, oh, stop, you better let me do that. <laughs> Assuming I'm an electrocute myself. Said, uh, you got a lot more years to live than I do, you should let me do that. And I said, I really appreciate that. You know, I'm ready to meet Jesus today. Do you know? Do you know for sure that you can go to heaven? That you will go to heaven if you electrocute yourself in the next five minutes? That conversation has led to a couple other conversations. When he sat on his tractor, turned off the engine and told me, I have cancer. Well, I'm going to pray that God will heal you but what's more important is that, than that is that you need to know Christ. Whenever your time is, you've got to know Jesus. 
He's the only way. Not religion, not tradition, not any of those things. You need to personally know Jesus, to trust in him, to take your sin from you. We've got to be ready to speak of Christ as we live for Christ. And this leads us to our third way of strengthening our witness for Christ. We must speak under the influence of God's grace in response to each person. Verse 6. Let your speech always, church, say it with me, always. Lord, help us. Oh, we sin in many ways, our tongue. James, it's coming up in a few weeks. Let your speech always be with grace. With what, church? Grace. As though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. How do do you know how to respond to each person? With what? Grace. Grace. I think the best way to understand verse 6 is is for our words to be gracious because they are under the influence of God's grace. Grace. Every other time Paul uses the word grace in the book of Colossians, it refers to God's grace, not mere human graciousness. And yet God's grace in us will produce gracious character and gracious conduct and gracious speech. Now, I know this doesn't come easily. For some of us, it's the battle of our life. It's the battle of our life. So what do we do? We run to Jesus, and this is something we pray about every day, every day, every day, every day. Lord, I need your grace to, to break down the, 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 the ri- rough, regi- rigid edges of my heart. Lord, I need your grace to, to be constant, a constant awareness in my life. Lord, I need to constantly stand in recognition of your grace at work in me so I can extend grace to others. Sometimes we need, we need to devote weeks and months to going after a very specific thing in our soul or in our life. Trusting God to work, and as we pray, God will work. As we pray, God will work. As we pray, God will work. But you've got to pray. You've got to come under the Lord in those things. So think of it this way. You are owned by grace. If you're a believer, you are owned by grace. A slave to grace. A slave to grace. You are filled with God's grace. You stand in God's grace for the express purpose of sharing that grace with others. And grace usually is needed most when somebody else is not gracious. (laughs) Right? Sorry to say it. You can literally say to yourself, my mouth belongs to God. My mouth belongs to God and He's ordained this awkward or irritating moment with this indifferent or even rude person, so I can give grace. You need to tell yourself this every day you go to work. I'm going to work to give grace. I'm going to work to give grace. I'm getting up this morning to work with toddlers, change diapers who need grace. Right? I was out walking a week and a half ago, what it was, And I just began my time with the Lord just saying, my life is not my own. In that moment, I realized I should probably start every day this way. I should probably start every morning walk this way. Lord, my life is not my own. I'm a slave of grace. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt. Now, just for clarity, all you young people, Paul is not talking about the salty speech, salty speech uh, (laughs) as the term is used today of someone who's angry, obviously, right, in the context. It just bugs me to no end when people change definitions of words. (laughs) My kids started talking about, oh, that person's salty, like, because they're going off on a rant about something. I'm like, You can't say that. That's not what that word means. I've got a proof text for it. (laughs) Anyway, nobody consults me on these things. Salt adds good taste. 
And salt preserves that which would otherwise spoil. So church, let your speech be as appetizing as possible for the gospel. Speech that is seasoned with grace is not careless, overly critical, mean-spirited, judgmental, pessimistic, rude, harsh, demanding. Do you get the picture? Okay, it's not, that, that's not good salt. As Paul wrote to the Ephesians, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, that it may give what? Grace to those who hear. What is edification? Building up. Beneficial. Strengthening. Helpful. Paul says, don't speak unwholesome words. Don't speak unwholesome words. Speak only those things which benefit. Speak only those things which are helpful according to the need of the moment, to the need of the moment, so you can give grace to those who hear. I know this is a holiday weekend, but I want to really strongly encourage us. Everybody listening now? I want to encourage all of us this morning to memorize Ephesians 4.29 and Colossians 4.6. They're very similar. You're going to mix them up. But memorize them. We need to memorize these verses. We need to memorize them. You know why? Because Colossians 4.6 says, so you'll know how to respond to each person. Well, how are you going to have that in your mind? How are you going to remember that? When you're at Walmart, I was... I was at Walmart or Sam's Club, one of those stores the other day. Walked up to a guy in a little blue vest. Sam's Club? What, Walmart? Whatever it was. I don't want to. I don't want to. I like these stores, so I'm not, I'm not trying to throw them under the bus. Walked up to this guy and said, hey, c- c- can you tell me where to find the blueberries? No. Walked off. <laughs> no? Now, in that moment... Suddenly, I need something in, in my mind to be there for the Holy Spirit to say, respond with grace, every person, all the time, be gracious. Right? You know? How else will we keep these things before us with the multitude of words we speak? I hope. But by the time I have grandchildren running around, I'm being realistic here. Give myself a little time. I hope that by the time I have grandkids running around, what they will hear out of my mouth day after day, moment after moment, is grace, grace, grace. I hope that's what you will hear this week. We will speak with grace when we are conscientiously aware of our indebtedness to God's grace and the other person's need to encounter God's grace through us. That trip to Walmart may really not be about blueberries. It may be about giving grace to someone. This is how verse 6 tells us to respond to each person. And when you respond to each person with grace, you will have credibility when God gives you the opportunity to speak about God's grace in Christ. So church, wherever God has placed you in your neighborhood, your workplace, your family, He has put you there to pray, to conduct yourself, and to speak in such a way that God will open doors. That your life will resemble the wise character of Christ and that your speech will bear the influence of God's grace. Oh, may the Lord help us. This is is our day of calling, church. In a time when people rage, this is our calling to be distinctively different. Even when we engage people on topics that are really hard to keep from combusting. Be who we are. Salt 
and light the body of Christ. As we come to the Lord's table this morning, we come to a table of great opportunity. Great opportunity. The power of our witness for Christ is undiluted in a life characterized by purity. Power proceeds from purity. And the opportunity we have before us in these moments is to confess and forsake the sins of impurity that diminish the power of God's grace to work through us. So in preparation for the Lord's Supper, I I urge you to invite the Holy Spirit in these moments to help you examine your speech, your conduct, your relationships, for any impurity that hinders your prayers. This is an opportunity to turn your heart to God's grace. The body and the blood of Christ were given to make you pure, free from sin, to fill you with the power of God's mighty Spirit. Father, this morning... I pray for myself and I pray for my brothers and sisters who've gathered here together that in these moments you'll make it intimately clear that you are with us. And your intent is to free us from our sin which so easily entangles us. Oh Lord, we sin in many ways. As, as, as Dave read at the beginning of the service this morning, if you should, if you should mark our iniquities, who, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you. And so, Lord, we come to your table this morning asking for the grace of the Holy Spirit <coughs> to convict us, to show us where we need to repent, where we need to turn, where we need to forsake And to remind us that your grace is sufficient for us to be forgiven and cleansed and refreshed and renewed and strengthened by your Spirit for a life that is pleasing to God that enjoys his favor. So Lord, in these moments, as as the gentlemen come, I pray you would help us in these, these moments of quiet prayer to meet you, Lord Jesus. And to once again be refreshed by the cleansing power of your grace. In Jesus' name. Gentlemen, if you'll come, and I encourage you during this time of quiet music that you would continue to take time to prepare your hearts for the Lord's Supper.